Well, welcome. This is our July webinar on fasting and MS, how to fast the right way. And my name is um, Dr. Susan Perovi. I'm a physician practicing integrative and functional medicine at Stanford um, University. We have an integrative medicine center at Stanford. It's been a wonderful playground for me to figure out what are the things that improve human health? How do we actually help people put those things into practice. And because I also live with a diagnosis of MS, I um, have a I have developed a, a, a online wellness program called True Medicine to really just focus on bringing integrative and functional medicine strategies to the to the multiple sclerosis community because I've had the personal experience of the profound impact on different lifestyle strategies on my own health and I've gotten to see it um, in action in my patients as well. So over the last decade, this has been the work that I've um, committed to. And I'm so excited to talk to you about fasting today because in many ways, fasting is the catapult into new lifestyle habits that maybe you weren't able to do before. Fasting changes your relationship to food. It helps you feel good fast. But there are things I want you to be aware of when you um, embark on a fasting practice. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about how fasting impacts your cells um, and, and the environment of your cells. This is really important. When we take pharmaceuticals, they're not really broadly impacting and supporting our cellular health, but lifestyle habits do. And so do herbal medicines. They have kind of this gentle, broad physiologic effect on our um, cellular environment. So this is something I want to bring to your attention. If this is not already part of your MS care, we've got to start thinking about what are we bathing our cells in? How do we improve that environment? I'm going to show you some of the data behind different fasting regimens and MS. And then we're going to find a fast, hopefully that works for you and get you started. And I also want to make sure that we do this safely. And I'm going to talk to you about some precautions. So let's talk about the gut. Um, the, the GI tract really goes from the brain all the way down to the end, which we call the anus. And it does this amazing job of taking food, you know, something from the external world, breaking it down, that's digestion, absorbing it, pulling those small molecules into the body, and then eliminating the leftover stuff that we don't need. So digestion, absorption, and elimination are really important um, functions to help us pull in building blocks to do all of the things that our bodies need to do. However, there are also repair, restoration, and renewal functions in the gut. And if these things don't have a chance to happen, then and you're constantly digesting and absorbing food, then you're going to have a damaged gut because there's no opportunity to do that repair and the cleanup. And so it's really important to give your GI tract a break. And it is important to make sure there are empty periods um, throughout the day for your GI tract so that it could do this really important work. There's something called the migrating motor complex that turns on when we stop eating. It is this special movement that happens throughout the GI tract to move junk outward and downward and out and to clean and repair. But if you're constantly eating, the migrating motor complex doesn't really have an opportunity to turn on. And so we're going to try to create empty periods in the GI tract by fasting, which is basically the abstinence of eating. Now, Fasting is not a new concept. I am sure that you are aware that it is an ancient practice that is time tested. People have fasted for thousands of years for health reasons, for religious reasons. Um, people still do modified fasts during Lent. There's also Ramadan, where for um, you know the month of Ramadan, people are fasting from sunrise to sunset. And these actually do have really profound effects on health. And we actually have data on what happens, for example, during Ramadan. And it's really profound and beautiful, actually. 
Now, one thing to re, um, appreciate is that not all fasting requires you to restrict calories, okay? You may restrict calories, but and that's certain kinds of fasts. And then there are other fasts where you just um, shrink down the window of time that you're eating. You can still eat all the calories you want without having to um, you know, cut down the amount of food you take in on a day. So how does fasting help MS? Well, with MS, we think about the immune system getting very dysregulated, which means that it forgets to follow the rules and inflammation turns on and doesn't really get the signal to turn off. So it's become dysregulated. The act of fasting helps bring more regulation to the immune system. So for example, you will move away from autoimmunity and inflammation towards a more normal level of functioning for your immune system. And as I said, inflammation comes down, there's this really cool thing called autophagy that happens. Auto means self and phagy means eating. So basically it's this process of starting to eat up the older dysfunctional cells making room for new cells to come in. And so autophagy has a chance to turn on when you have had um, a fasting period. Now, you know, it, 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 overnight when you're sleeping, very small amounts of autophagy start, maybe at six or eight hours. But the longer you go without food, the more this autophagy process turns on and the more efficient it becomes. There's a lot of studies that show at 24 hours, you're getting tons of autophagy, but you don't have to push it to 24 hours. Um, so as you're removing these older, more dysfunctional cells, you're making room for healthier new cells to come in, stem cells are regenerating, and basically you're slowing down cellular aging. So basically what you're doing is you are creating a new you that is comprised of healthier, newer cells. You turn on your antioxidant genes. And this is really important because antioxidants protect our cells and proteins and DNA. So antioxidants are protectors. And we need them even for normal processes like the process of digesting food or um, detox. Everything in the body throws off some dangerous molecules called um, free radicals. And by having our antioxidants neutralize these compounds, we protect our cells. So fasting is a signal you are sending from your environment deep into your DNA to turn on your antioxidant genes. I think that's actually really cool because this is a way where you have a great level of control over what's happening at the cellular level. Just start fasting and you're gonna turn on desirable genes. And blood sugar improves with fasting. There are studies that show that people who are insulin dependent, they've had diabetes for 20 years, go on a highly um, you know, supervised, medical, medically supervised fast and they actually can come off of insulin. That's really profound, actually, because we don't think of, you know, insulin need being reversed. But this is the power of eating less and allowing the GI tract to um, replenish itself, to bring more in regulation to the immune system, to lower inflammation. And so blood sugar can improve. And blood sugar control isn't imp important just for diabetics. It is actually important for MS as well. Anytime blood sugar starts creeping up and you no longer have tight blood sugar control, inflammation increases. So this is a really important concept for MS care. And also um, just by fasting, DNA repair improves, tumors are better suppressed. So um, you know, if, if there's a cancer history, now you're creating a favorable environment so you can go in and surveil for those cancers and cut them out before things get too far down the line. So before we kind of go into the data, I want to talk about safety first. Always start easy. Do not jump into a 16 or a 24 or a 48 hour fast. I always tell people, don't be a hero. Um, you're just going to ease into fasting. And um, 
uh, go slow over time. You have to give your body to adjust. Never do anything extreme. I, um, and so just be mindful of that. You'll get more out of being careful and doing things for long term than to do a short term fast. Always drink water. In fact, while you're awake, hopefully you're making urine every two hours or so. You're making lots and lots of urine throughout. Please talk to your doctor if you're thinking about a fast, especially if you have unstable blood sugars or low blood sugars or high blood sugars, even if they're well controlled on medications and supplements. And because we want to make sure that we don't always take away food and carbs from you and have your blood sugars plummet, because that's a very dangerous situation and you can die in a relatively short period of time from low blood sugar. Also, if there's a history of an eating disorder, please be very mindful about fasting. Uh, if it's bulimia, anorexia, um, overeating, whatever it might be, um, please make sure that you're being safe. Talk to your doctor first. Okay, so we're going to talk about three different types of fasting. The terminology gets a little murky. And so at the end of the day, I don't want you to get caught up in what's what and how things are classified, other than I'm going to talk to you about three different kinds of fasts and to present some data to you. All right, so um, intermittent fasting um, generally requires calorie restriction. Fasting mimicking diets also require calorie restriction. And fasting mimicking diets are a type of intermittent fasting. Time-restricted feeding or time-restricted eating don't require you to restrict calories. And so as I'm talking about them, I actually prefer that you start with time-restricted feeding. Okay, so let's talk about intermittent fasting. Um, what are the benefits? There's data that it lowers, um, and this uh, comes not just from MS literature, but many different chronic conditions, but generally it reduces inflammation. It protects the brain and the central nervous system. It reduces stress on your cellular environment and it can result in weight loss. Now there's a lot of other benefits, but I'm just naming a few. Um, blood um, sugar sensitivity improves. So, so actually insulin sensitivity improves, which means you can pull blood sugar out more efficiently out of the blood and into cells. Blood pressure can improve. Your gut starts to move better. So for example, constipation improves. And you know these points here on the second bullet are actually really um, important for overall health. As I said, intermittent fasting requires calorie restriction, and there's many different ways to do it, but I'm going to present two different regimens to you. There's You can either do alternate day fasting, where you're 24 hours on, 24 hours off, so you can have a normal day today, and then you fast for 24 hours, and then you have another normal day, and so on. This is not where I would have you start. This is a big jump. Um, but there's also the 5-2 plan. And this is actually much more doable. So any five days of the week, you eat your normal diet, no calorie restriction needed. Any two non-consecutive days, so you don't wanna do two days next to each other, you have to have them separated by a day in between at least, you are either doing a 24 hour fast or you can eat, but you're cutting down your calories by about a by about two thirds. So about 600 calories for men, 500 for women. This is actually easier to do than the alternate day. And so, um, and, and you can pick which two days of the week you do the either full restriction of no food for 24 hours or you're restricting calories down. Let me show you some of the data. Here's a mouse study. Mice are like people, sort of. And, you know, nutrition studies are hard to do in humans. And um, so we use the mouse model to help us see what can happen when we do an intervention. So um, what happened was they fed the, the mouse model of MS, they're called EAE mice. So basically they inject them with something. Several weeks later, the mice develop a um, a, uh, a condition that's demyelinating that looks like MS. And so what they did here was they fed the mice every other day for four weeks and looked to see what happened. They ended up seeing that 
in the gut microbiome, so in the large intestine of the mice, the diversity of good bacteria increased. That's a good thing. And the microbiome, you know, plays a really important role in everything, the immune function, nervous system function, mood. And so just by doing this every other day fasting, they got to see more diverse my, uh, gut microbiome. They saw favorable changes in T cells and T cells do play a role in MS. So they saw certain populations pop up that are more favorable for um, improving MS symptoms in these mice. They also saw um, more favorable cytokines being um, uh, secreted because um, cytokines are communication molecules of the immune system. And so they're now seeing more favorable cells and communication molecules showing up just by this act of eating every other day. And then what they did was they um, took these mice that were eating every other day, took a sample from their microbiome and put it um, into mice that had this MS-like condition. And um, it actually slowed the progression of MS in these mice. Okay, so what this tells us is that you do an intervention of fasting, the microbiome changes to a favorable state. And if you can take that and put it into mice with MS, the MS improves, okay? Now we can't easily um, take this and extrapolate it to human data, but this is really um, you know, important. Um, and it's, uh, it's maybe a sign that this could also happen in humans. Um, and, and I have to say, we do have some data that the gut microbiome improves in people with MS with intermittent fasting, but the data is not that strong. And before, you know, we get too far into this, I have to tell you, our fasting data for MS isn't very strong. So I'm just pulling what's out there in the literature and just showing it to you. And then I'm going to talk to you about how to, in the end, come up with how you're going to fast. Here's another um, study on intermittent fasting in MS patients. And um, what they found was, um, well, they, what they did was they had three groups. They either had people restrict their calories um, by 22% every day. So every day they had to eat less. The second group um, had to drop their calorie intake by 75% just two days a week. So they were doing the 5-2 plan. And then the third group didn't have to ca restrict calories at all. They were the group. And then they compared what happened with these three groups after eight weeks. So here's what they found. CR stands for calorie restriction. So um, the two groups that either restricted calories every day a week showed these patients reported improvements in their well-being and depression scores compared to the people who just ate a normal um, diet every day. And um, these were statistically significant. So there's ways that they can determine whether or not these findings are by chance or no, they're actually st statistically significant. And um, these were real results found with the people who were doing calorie restriction, whether it was the daily or the two times a week. Um, there was weight loss with both of the groups that restricted calories and the people who restricted their calories every day lost more weight. And what they found was people who did the daily calorie restriction versus the people who did it five, two days a week actually were able to stick to the program better. So that's just what they found in this study. I don't know that that actually translates to real life, but that's what this study showed. Okay, moving on to the second group of, or the second type regimen of um, fasts, the fasting mimicking diet. This one does require calorie restriction. There's many different ways to do it. Um, there's the one, there's a, basically the one that we that we have data on a lot in humans actually um, is you do five days consecutive five days of a plant-based diet now that doesn't mean you have to become a vegetarian but you're eating mostly plants so five days of a plant-based diet but at reduced calories about half of what you normally eat every day you do that five days in a row and then the other 25 days of the month no calorie restriction you just do eat your healthy plant-based diet. And if you can get 
three to six cycles in, in a year, that goes a long way. You don't even have to do this every month. And one cycle is five consecutive days followed by 25 days of not fasting um, and not restricting calories. And so this is actually sustainable. I do know people who do this, um, but it, again, I don't think it's the entry point into fasting, um, but, it, but it's something you can work up to. Data outside of just MS shows us that this results in weight loss, cholesterol um, panels improve, blood sugar improves, inflammation and autoimmunity improve. Um, actually, there's some data for MS. And this is actually a strategy used to live longer. Okay. How, how, is, how is this helping you live longer? Well, you are healthier at a cellular level. Remember, you're doing more autophagy and you're... Um, uh, you're pulling out the older dysfunctional cells and making room for new cells to come in. So you're becoming a healthier and newer you. And so here's um, a, a study in mice that showed um, that they did, they did um, the fasting mimicking diet for three days. Um, they didn't do the five days and then 25 days. They just did it for, for three days um, where they restricted their calories down to about half. And they actually saw that MS symptoms in these mice improved and there was less demyelination. That's pretty cool, right? It actually gave the immune system and the nervous system the opportunity to do some repair. And um, what they found was they were also able to measure more favorable chemical messengers, cytokines, and more favorable immune cells pulling into the central nervous system just by the act of cutting calories down for three days in mice. So they concluded that um, fasting mimicking diet um, in these EAE mice suppressed autoimmunity and inflammation and also promoted remyelination and recovery of tissues, okay? This makes me feel excited. Again, it's a mouse study. We can't easily uh, extrapolate this to humans, but it's an important finding. And it's just gonna take more time to really kind of hash this out in, in human populations. And then here's another study on fasting mimicking diets that showed um, a, that in a group of mice they, that um, ended up getting injected with a, a protein and ended up developing an MS-like condition, um, what they did was they, once they started seeing signs of demyelination and symptoms like MS, they, um, for three days in a row, um, cut the calories down to a third of what they would normally eat. And then this was followed by um, four normal days and they did two cycles of this, okay? So just two cycles of cutting calories down by two thirds. And so they're only eating a third of what they normally eat and then just four days of normal and then going back and doing it again. So what they found was this decreased the severity of symptoms. Um, there was um, less infiltration of unwanted cells in the spinal cord, and there was less CNS demyelination, right? So it's almost slowing things down and interrupting that autoimmune process. And some of these CD4 cells um, that can cause inflammation were also coming down in numbers. Also, what they found was um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is protective for the brain, these levels increased and they saw more um, molecules that were indicative, indicative of remyelination. All right, so now I'm going to go to the third type of fasts. Um, this is time-restricted eating. This is the one I'd love for you to focus on. This is the one I do. This is the one I talk to my patients about doing because it's sustainable, it's doable, it's relatively easy, and it's a great entry point into fasting. Many people call this overnight fasting. Many people call this intermittent fasting. At the end of the day, I don't care what you call it. It's more important to just know what it is and how to do it. This does not require you to restrict calories. Um, and in and I'm going to you know in non MS populations, we have data that it helps improve blood sugar, blood pressure, lowers um, stress on your cells, and um, uh, fat 
levels come down. So basically weight loss and redistribution of fat. You, this actually can help even re reduce some of that, that belly fat that tends to accumulate as we get stressed, as we get older, as our health declines. And um, also we have data in non-MS populations that inflammation reduces, immune function improves, and we get to see more of these neuroprotective molecules. And all of these things are so important for MS. So with time-restricted eating, here's how it goes. You're going to start easy. Maybe you even think to yourself, huh, how many hours do I generally go between the last thing I put in my mouth before I go to sleep and the first thing I put in my mouth in the morning? And water, black coffee, and like tea without sugar and cream don't count. So how many hours are you doing already? Some of you might be doing eight to 10. Some of you might be doing 12 and some of you might be doing more, but it's good to kind of know where you're at on average. And the key here is to have an early dinner. So what you don't actually want to do is to start your fast late at night and then delay breakfast by a lot to get that maybe 10 or 12 hours in. So I like people to stop eating three hours before bed because that gives your upper GI tract an opportunity to empty out. And so your GI tract doesn't have to be um, you know, highly engaged in digestion and absorption um, uh, while you're trying to sleep. While you're sleeping is the time where the GI tract wants to clean itself up right? Remember those special movements happen. The migratory motor complex turns on to clean up and repair. So early dinner, three hours before bed. If you're a nighttime snacker, maybe you just start with cutting out that late night snack. Okay. So as I said, black tea, herbal tea, coffee, um, uh, water, totally fine. Just don't put sugar and cream in there because you don't want to wake up the GI tract. Um, keep drinking water uh, every two hours, I, roughly, you should be having to use the restroom because that's a good sign that you're well hydrated. You can use the color of the urine as a marker as well. It's not totally scientific, but hey, that's what we've got when, it, when we're at home. So let's say you're already doing 10 hours. You're going to slowly increase to 11 to 12 hours. And you start increasing this um, window of time where you're not eating and you see how you feel. This is where it becomes really important to have this awareness, body awareness of like, how do I feel right now? Do I feel good? Do I feel tired, lethargic? When you feel start feeling depleted and low energy, just eat. It's not a big deal. You know, it, we're we're gonna we're talking about doing fasting long term, and so it's not about what you do over one day. It's about what you do over many months and years. So you're going to slowly increase that fasting window as tolerated. Still trying to not eat the last three hours before bed. Um, not a lot of data here uh, for time-restricted eating, um, but um, this was an, an, a study looking at people with MS. I think they recruited three times the amount of people, but only eight completed it, but it still showed us some important information. What they did was they took these people with relapsing, remitting MS and put them on a 16-8 fast. 16 is the, the amount of time fasting and eight is the amount of time you're eating. So you're eating your all your food in a 24 hour period over eight hours. So for example, they were not allowed to go beyond 11 a.m. They had to eat by 11 a.m. in the morning. And so that means that they had to finish by 7 p.m. Okay, they could start earlier, but 11 a.m. was their deadline. And what they found was people did well with this. It was, um, they were able to comply. They, it, it was safe. There were no major side effects. In fact, even with um, fasting, mimicking diets and intermittent fasting, those are all well tolerated as long as you ease into it. Now they wanted to measure um, patient reported health outcomes, but the study was too small. They just couldn't draw any firm conclusions, but Asking people how they felt, some said they had more energy, they were sleeping better, reflux decreased, overall they were feeling better, they were drinking more water. So these are actually pretty much in line with what I hear from patients. You know, people feel good when they're not loading up their GI tract all the time. And I put this um, study up here 
to kind of help simplify or to actually create more confusion about what is the best um, fast for MS. And what they did here was they, um, let's see, uh, compared daily calorie restriction with intermittent calorie restriction with time restricted feeding. So they're kind of throwing everything together and seeing what sticks. And what they found was, well, first of all, all of the different groups that they created with all the different fasts, they were all safe. There were no, no complications. I think one person reported a, a migraine, but they already had migraines. Um, people who did calorie restriction actually weren't able to stick with the program as much. Calorie restriction is actually more challenging than to just change, shifting the eating window like you do with time restricted eating or that overnight fast. Um, and you know their other conclusion was um, time restricted eating was probably a, an easier place to start and that we need more data. And what they also concluded was nutrition research is hard. You know, you can take the most dedicated people, uh, myself included, you know, if I was in a research study and if I had to comply with a study like this, I don't know if I could do it more than a few days. It is really hard. I do know a few people who do, you know, participate in research studies and can go for a year or two years, but that's, that's unusual. And so data on fasting and nutrition is really hard to come by. Okay. So what is the best fast for MS? Well, first of all, it's the fast that you're willing to do, okay? To me, as a physician working with patients, it doesn't matter where they start as long as they're being safe and they're excited about what they're doing. The data is sparse. There's no firm conclusions. Like, I can't tell you if you do this fasting regimen, you are going to remyelinate, we know some mice remyelinated, but I don't know how that translates to humans. And data doesn't always reflect the real world, right? We can go and look at data on all kinds of things, but when it actually comes to people putting things into practice, sometimes these things don't quite line up together. And so even though the data is really important, safety is important, um, it helps us figure out how to not spin our wheels and waste time on things that don't work. Um, I think it's also important to kind of step back and look at the big picture. The point of fasting is to give the GI tract empty periods so that it can heal itself. So however you choose to do that is probably going to be helpful to you. We're not at the place where we can like put a, a magnifying glass on you and say, oh yeah, you remyelinated and your cytokines are improved. Like that just doesn't happen in clinical practice. Think about what works for your lifestyle. Do you have a job? where you have you are away from being around you know your kitchen where you can eat you know in a 168 regimen where you're eating from like let's say 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. maybe that doesn't work for you maybe you'd rather fast on the weekends right um so you got to think about what works for you what are you willing to do and you know some people actually don't want to fast and that's okay too this is fasting is just one tool among many tools and so um you know if it doesn't work for you that's fine i do have people who try it and they go i feel terrible well then fasting is not for you or maybe you need to work on your diet and eat more whole foods that are going to um, really nourish you and stabilize blood sugar before you can feel good on um, a, you know, a fasting regimen, then, then this is something that can actually be really profound. And I highly recommend that you um, stick to it and create a regimen, maybe do it with a friend, get into a program that can help you do it, talk to your doctor, Th think about your goals and is, is fasting in line with, with the goals that you want to achieve. So here are my best tips on when to eat. So this is more than just fasting, but you know, looking at a lot of people, having self-experimented on myself I, and looking into traditional Chinese medicine and what Ayurvedic medicine has to say, here are some things that you can start doing today to help improve your gut health, to help um, strengthen your cellular health, lower inflammation. This is something I learned from the pandemic. I was making three meals from scratch every day for my family and it was exhausting. And 
my neighbor said she only feeds her family twice a day. And I thought, well, is that allowed? Yes, it's allowed. And this is actually something we've adopted. We only eat two solid meals a day. And um, this can change sometimes, whether it's a school day or a weekend, but generally eating two to three solid meals a day without a lot of snacking is the way to go. When you eat, don't eat until you're 110% full. Eat until you're about three fourths full and then sit back and just be mindful and tune into your body. Can you just stop eating, maybe walk away for 10 minutes and then you can have more food if you want to. Within a few weeks, you can actually get to this point where you're not overloading your GI tract. Okay, so eat until you're about 75% full. What happens is within about 20 minutes, your, your brain and your gut catch up and you go, oh, I'm not actually hungry. So, um, and then you won't want to eat that extra amount that you would have maybe been, would have been your second helping. Um, avoid snacking. Every time you eat, you're turning on the GI tract. And as you're digesting food, you're, you know, if there's carbs in there, you're turning on insulin and cortisol, and you're turning on the hormone system. You're, you know, um, having to put out digestive enzymes. And so if we're snacking, we're constantly engaging the GI tract with digestion and absorption. And if we can just cut out the snacking or keep it to a minimum because we're eating two to three solid meals, then the GI tract can just get in, do digestion absorption and get out, right? So think about this. If you're a big snacker, maybe you cut out snacking. This could be a wonderful place to start before you embark on fasting. Um, we did talk about eating, stopping eating three hours before bed so the upper GI tract can empty. And if you can go to bed feeling even a little bit hungry, that might actually be a good sign that um, the upper GI tract has now moved on, it's, it's open, and you're ready to go to sleep and have repair happen. If you're a diabetic, I have unstable blood sugars, be careful with this because your medications have probably been titrated to how you normally eat. So you'll need to talk to your doctor about how to adjust medications if all of a sudden you're moving all these eating windows or cutting down calories. Uh, delay breakfast by a bit. So maybe you don't eat the first thing you know when you wake up. You might start noticing that if you delay breakfast, you're actually not that hungry until you start eating and then your GI tract turns on and then you start thinking about food more. So, um, you know, maybe start delaying breakfast by an hour and see how that goes. Again, you're listening to your body. How do you feel? Um, does it feel good or do you feel low energy? And as a good starting point, I would just aim for that time restricted eating overnight start with 10 to 12 hours. You may want to increase that over time. If you're already doing 12 hours, go to 13 or 14. I think most people do pretty well around 15 or 16 hours. Um, that I know that is certainly true for myself. Some I, I try to get to 16, oftentimes at 14 or 15 hours. I'm hungry. I feel like I need to eat. And then I just break my fast and eat. It's not about hitting that magic number. Even at 14, 12 hours, you're doing autophagy. You're sending good signals to your immune system and your DNA and um, your nervous system. All right. So remember, I showed you this slide at the beginning. How does fasting help MS? It helps lower um, uh, autoimmunity and inflammation. We put healthier cells into the body. We're protecting ourselves by turning on antioxidant genes. Blood sugar improves. But here from my own personal and clinical experience, I can tell you that weight loss is a part of it. Um, mood improves. So anxiety and depression. In fact, I showed you that one study that um, had those MS patients show scored um, better on depression scales. So mood can improve, your energy can improve. And if you're dealing with fatigue, um, I think being careful about not cutting down calories at first, but just shifting that eating window, that time-restricted eating, overnight eating can be really helpful in boosting your energy. So try it. You might notice something positive in the next, in a few weeks, one to two weeks even. GI symptoms will improve. Why? 
because you are allowing that repair process to happen. Um, so if you, and gut health is so important for, for MS health, for immune health. In fact, in Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, we say um, gut health is the foundation of good health. It's also the root of poor health. If your gut health isn't great, it's going to impact every other system in the body. And so because gut, gut health is so important, we actually have a gut health program at True Medicine to just get people to start improving how the GI tract is functioning. You are going to have greater control over your appetite. You might you may stop being hungry all the time and sneak, seeking food all the time. And what's wonderful about this is that you become more mindful about eating, your relationship to food changes, and um, you actually will feel more in control of your body, of your health, of your MS care. So this is actually really important because we as patients sometimes have a lot of things done to us by doctors, they give us medications and go do labs and go do your MRI. And it feels like we sometimes don't have a say in the matter. But when we start fasting and feeling good, we have now done something really positive for our, for our health. And that feels good. We feel more in control. So here's a picture I like to show when it comes to autoimmunity. Um, autoimmunity is a spectrum. It's not at all or nothing where either you have no autoimmunity or you're in full-blown autoimmunity. And think of it as gradations. You could have a very well-regulated immune system where you're not inflamed and your immune system's ticking along great, or you could be more dysregulated when the immune system has forgotten the rules and it's attacking its own tissues and inflammation is on without knowing when to turn off. And so you may already be aware that you can move back and forth on this um, continuum because you, when you have a relapse, you might be more on the orange side. And when your relapse improves, you mo move more to towards the cooler side. And so healthier lifestyle habits like good sleep, good anti-inflammatory foods, plant-based foods, um, exercise, stress management, move you to the blue side. And conversely, poor lifestyle habits move you to the, the dysregulated inflamed side. So we actually do have some control on where we are on this continuum and um, we can we can move back and forth based on our daily behaviors, right? So, and what decisions we make about the foods we eat, when we go to sleep, how we manage our stress, et cetera.